Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no-holes ball. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out MMA History Podcast. I am Joey Venti. I'm with the MMA detective Mike Davis. We have a very special episode for you today. Our guest is a former professional boxer and MMA world champion with wins in events such as Super Brawl, Icon, Elite, Elite XC, Strike Force, and the UFC. He can be found these days protecting lives and property for the greatest fire department in the world. Welcome to the show, KJ Nunes. How's it going, guys? So, KJ, your fight career ended. I mean, you closed that chapter in your life. And it seems like you've never looked back. What are we doing now? So, um, I don't even bear with me if I miss a couple things on years, but um, I want to say at 30 or 30, at 30 years old, I know I stopped my last fight, I was, I think, at 32 or maybe 33. I can't remember. Um, I'm 41 today. Um, I started losing and I wanted to do something else, you know, and I went back to school um to get my emt and i want to be a fireman and i kept applying applying it took me a while to get hired but um i actually could have kept fighting but i just stopped fighting focused everything on trying to start a new career so i want to say in 2018 um of uh march that's when uh, i got hired by los angeles county fire department but it had taken about it took me about it took me about um almost five years to get hired so I started, I want to say I started the process at 30, going back to school, I had a couple more fights um, just to pay some bills. But then I just actually, I want to say, I want to say 32, don't quote me, but that's when I just completely stopped fighting and went and worked other jobs to just try to get away from um, MMA because it's so easy to get sucked back in. And just be like, oh, I'll take one more fight. I'll take one more fight. I'll take one more fight, you know, and then just kind of be the stepping stone for next talent. You know what I mean? Joey, I think you know something about his department. Okay, yeah. Uh, the year before you got hired by L.A. County, I retired medically from L.A. County. So you're not only in my old department, you're in my old battalion. I understand you're at fours, correct? Yes, at fours, yep. Dude. <coughs> uh, you, uh, you, hit the, you hit the lottery on that, dude. Congratulations. Huge department, uh, yeah. great department. Oh, thanks, man. It's uh, yeah, like you know, they say it's uh, it's like winning the lottery there, and then, you know, uh, the place I'm at right now, it's I've been there just at four, it's coming on four years, and it's Boys Town, man. It's like old school. It's fun. It's um, it's not every fire station you know is like, you know, um, <laughs> what you would think of it as, you know what I mean? But four is right, definitely, of course, four is definitely is all of it. So we have a great time, great great group of guys, and we all hang out outside the station, which is pretty fun as well. That's awesome. What's uh yeah, so that I'm really enjoying it, man. It's it's a lot, a lot of fun. As far as backup plans go, man, you can't do any better than the fire department. I, I miss it. I, I did it for 17 years. I wish I was still there with you guys, but uh, you know, I'm glad you landed uh, in my spot. Thanks, man. Yeah, it was um it was a super it's it was just a it was a crazy ride to even get there. Um I mean, I'm sure you know because of all the baby boomers that are retiring, there's opening spots, but there wasn't opening spots for years. Right. And, um, you know, my best friend, he works for Oceanside, uh, Dave Pepsi, one of my, he started mentoring me how to do it, how to do the interviews. It's a whole process, not just oh, yeah. an application. And he told me, he goes, Hey, get ready to, it's going to take you five to seven years to get hired. And I didn't do the medic way, you know, which was a couple more years. And right about at five years, I was like, man, man, I should start looking at something else. I'm 35 now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I was I got hired at 35, but now it's like, okay, got to start looking at something else because it's such a difficult uh, – it's hard to get hired. Oh, it's a lot of competition, yeah. Yeah, not a lot of jobs. Not a lot of jobs and an abundance of people that want it. So, KJ, why don't we, go, why don't we be, start at the beginning? Grew up in Hawaii until the age of 16. Um, mm -hmm. Were you a mixed martial artist at that time, or were you doing more traditional karate? I grew up, so my, um, I grew up, my dad put me in martial arts at like, um, she's five years old. I did, Ed, uh, Ed Parker's Kempo Karate, um, did that. So about, I, I think I got, I got my black belt at 12, 
um, a junior black belt. But right around, <clears throat> right around like I think eight years old, I was getting, I was getting um, disqualified from like the point karate tournament. So I want to say at seven or eight, I went into uh, boxing, amateur boxing, Kona Boxing Club. Um, started getting um, trained by uh, Sonny Westbrook. Famous family out of Y and I, uh, a lot of boxing history, and I uh, just started boxing, man. Boxing, I had a lot of boxing fights, amateur. Um, I mean, a lot. We were going every weekend, and then, um, geez, I want to say it like ten. So, yeah, Sonny had a lot of guys, a lot of guys, a lot of guys under us at the Kona Boxing Gym, and bear with me because my my memory is pretty shot, uh, but. Um, Let's see, we had a lot of good guys in there, and uh, I think around 10 or 12, I got with Rudy Valentino. He was a pro, ex-pro, Muay Thai, you know, um, he taught me Muay Thai, and and, and he actually sh uh, showed up later on the scene. He was a uh, BJ Penn striking coach down the line for years. Um, he became, uh, and he was on the helo side with BJ. But growing up, I, I got with Rudy and just kept competing. Um yeah, a lot, like it traveled for kickboxing, kickboxing, um, sand show, uh, boxing, all the way till you know till eighteen. So I was, I was, I had a lot, a lot of amateur fights. So who was your first jujitsu instructor? Um, so kind of fast forward. Um, I actually when I moved to Houston because my dad uh, had some business and was there from Hawaii. I went to Houston's kickboxing gym under Mike Altman. And this was, I think I want to say in like 98, but uh, my buddy had been like, I had, I had done no jujitsu. My buddy was watching all those jujitsu, uh, Hoist Gracie jujitsu um, tapes <laughs> in his, uh, back in like 98, you know, they're all the volumes. Nobody really knew too much about it, but one of my best friends choked out this huge, like 20, 250 pound dude in like high school. And he's a skinny 150 pound guy. And, he broke his arm and choked him out. And I'm like, dude, I got to get into this. So we were just watching videos, you know, messing around at like, you know, 16, 17. Um, I guess really fast forward. I never really rolled until I won. I'm kind of jumping forward fast, but on the pride trials, I don't know when that was. I think it was. Man I got it. Okay. So the pride trials, <laughs> but so you didn't go with Ensign NUA or Helson or Helson Gracie. Well, let me. I'll try. I'll, I'll bounce back, but to, to where yeah. you want to see who taught me jujitsu, right? Well, well, where was the the start? Because like you came out of nowhere, and like the first time that I heard of you was it was August of two thousand four. You did the K one tryouts, mm -hmm. and then in November of two thousand four, you did the Pride tryouts. You had like two fights same day in a tournament, mm -hmm. and you were the old like you were the biggest name that everybody was talking about, and like the the hardcore fans like well who is he yeah man I, I had so many amateur fights as a kid and you know that's where it really started um put it this way the first time and back to i know we kind of bounced around uh bounced around excuse me because i had a couple of beers just at the super bowl yesterday but um <laughs> back uh, i remember the first time when i said i was eight years old right i walked into the kona boxing gym and i I remember it like yesterday. I had won a couple tournaments, like eight. And my buddy, big local boy, goes, hey, come on in. I'll, I'll teach you how to box. You know, you, you're, you're a fighter. I get in there, and my buddy's a couple years older than me, and the first punch he throws right down the pipe. Boom, broken nose. Broke my nose. <laughs> broke my nose, blood everywhere. And I said, man, uh, I said, I'm going to come back every day until I beat that ass. And it took me about three or four years of a beat down in the box. <laughs> So I was about 12 or 13, but I beat his ass. It took me that long. And uh, that's kind of how I got into the, um, the really the, the more full contact. But I had so many fights and also travel. I traveled to China or was in the U.S. for um, Chinese kickboxing when I was like, I want to say 17 or 18. I was fighting in different um, – I was just fighting everywhere, man. I was fighting uh, – I was fighting in uh, Strike Force back in like – when it you was were 16. Kickboxing. Yeah, yeah, so we we were just like we were putting anything down just to keep fighting. So I had I had a, I had a lot of fights up to whenever I broke into scene in two thousand four, um, like you said, the Pride Trials. So, um, kind of a funny story. Do we have do we have a little bit of time? Do you want to hear how I got? Uh, bro, let me tell you something. We've got so much time. 
It's okay. do you have time? So go here. So just so everybody knows, at the age of 16, Strike Force Kickboxing, Scott Coker's original promotion. Um, yes. You fought Travis Johnson. You fought Travis Johnson, uh, September 28, 2002. So we were even, I mean, back then we were lying on the thing to fight pro. Like, I was just putting 18. And, you know, we knew Scott. So he didn't, you know, he didn't care back then just to fight, you know, amateur pro, whatever it is. Just, I was willing to fight anybody anytime. Um, but fast forward to, and we'll kind of get to the, um, to the, uh, pride trials. I, I'd moved to Houston. Um, and then I moved to, uh, San Diego back in, I don't know, uh, I guess, Oh, four. Um, I went to Mark Dion's, um, gym in San city Diego. Kickbox, or city um, boxing. Yeah. Yeah. He was managing a uh, Brandon Vare at the time. And then he started to manage me, but I wanted to do more boxing back then. So when we went to that pride trials, I had a little bit of jujitsu. I had all the boxing, kickboxing. Um, we went out there, and I, I said I would. I just wanted to um, check out LA because I'd never been to LA. And I just moved to San Diego, so all these guys are training every night. We go up the night before, and me and Mark go out. You know, we party all night, get drunk because I'm not doing the trials for Pride. All the other guys are. Next morning, wake up, go to the uh, UCLA for the Pride trials. And I'm like, you know, fuck it, I'm here. Why don't I just enter in it as well? You know, I'm here, why not? Well, it was a long process. Um, went through all the people that want me to spar and, and whatever interviews, and I ended up winning the whole thing. <laughs> I ended up being the, uh, I guess, best striker and I guess the most prestigious award to get signed by Pride, right? Um, which was kind of ridiculous because uh, I had never really fought any MMA. Uh, Boss Rudin and Dan Henderson, that's the, they're the ones who picked me. So now I'm fast forward in MMA and they ship me out to Matt Hume out of, um, out of Seattle. Oh, uh, stud. Here's, wow. here's how, here's the learning curve where I really got to know. I already had the fighting background. Um, and I'll kind of bounce back, sorry, bounce back to what I used to do too, as well as some of the UFC champs in Houston. But now I'm in San Diego when the, when the trials, they shipped me to Matt Hume in Seattle, um, where he's got uh, Mock Sakurai. I you heard of Mock Sakurai. Come on, oh yeah, bro. of course. Okay. Yeah. So you talking about like you know he had everybody. He had uh, um, God. If you look back then, I mean, he had, he had Josh Barnett. He, he had yeah. Uh, Barnett. He had uh, he had so many Dennis guys. Dennis <laughs> Exactly. Aaron Riley. Stop, 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 Ivan Salvador. Yeah, Ivan Salvary. 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 Yeah. Sorry, Ivan. Um, Chris Lieben, I eventually show up there, but we get up there and I don't have any. I'm living up there. We're training twice a day. And Matt Hume goes, get in the room with this guy, Sakurai. I'm like, I don't know who the fuck this guy is, right? I have no idea. We get in there. We just start brawling it out. And we're like, he's cussing. At, we're, we're trying to still fight outside the ring. I, he cut my eye. I'd never been cut before out of probably 100 amateur fights and boxing for who knows how long. You know, I'm mother, motherfucking him. He's motherfucking me. I'm like, so then I go back to my room, <laughs> uh, my hotel room, which I was really wait wait wait, 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 wait. You're motherfucking him in English. He's motherfucking you in Japanese because he doesn't speak exactly. English. Just because we're in a straight brawl for a friend. He was getting the best of me and nobody really got it really ever. And I was getting, it was back and forth and he was pretty mad because I was getting him pretty good too, right? Just straight stand up, no ground. Is this boxing gloves? No, just kickboxing. I mean, the guy is fucking amazing. Kickboxing gloves. Uh, kick, we're doing kickboxing, Muay Thai. Okay. Uh, so then I go back to my room and, um, oh, excuse me, a guy under, uh, anyways, a good friend of mine who's a black belt now at a San Diego, I can't think of his name. Um, I go, Hey man. Um, Oh, Bob, Jitsu Bob. He has a black belt. He goes, who, like, who the fuck is this guy? Max Sakurai. He cut me. Fuck this. I goes, he said, this guy's a legend, dude. He's one, you know, Abu Dhabi. This guy's like, and he started shooto champ. So. Every day after that, I lived in Seattle. I, I lived in Seattle for about, I don't know. I lived in Seattle twice for three months at a time. So go figure. I don't know how many days that works out. Six months, right? Every single day, morning workout, afternoon workout. Every day, my main partner, because we're the same size, was Mock Sakurai. So that's oh why I learned to God. Do I'm rolling with this guy every single day. And I should have used it, 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 every single So my my. My IQ for jujitsu was insane from the start. It was, a, it was like 
it was like somebody packaged up a jiu-jitsu package for me on steroids and gave it to you right away because you, you know what i'm saying and now i'm signed with a company that is expecting me to perform so that's kind of how i got introduced to jiu-jitsu kind of like you know every day rolling fighting punching a show each other especially the mat him what a i mean it was it was pretty pretty fucking tough pretty tough school <laughs> did, did, did you go with dennis hallman as well no, I don't think he, Dennis wasn't up there when I was up there. It was, I didn't they, see they, they always say that he was Matt Hume's favorite student because Matt would explain something one time to him and he could actually perform it like in a live exchange. Yeah, every, everyone well, talks about I his feel, IQ. I think so Matt Hume, though, um, if you don't get it right away, he'll beat it into you or you'll give up. <laughs> or he'll somebody else beat it into you. The guy is like very old school, like doesn't. It was a great, great place to learn. Um, but if you got an injury, it was re- literally sink or swim over there, which is great for it, it, it. Bred he had a lot of good champions there. He was the guy for Pride that would they send all their good guys over to train. He would train them. He's still with One FC. <laughs> One FC. He's got that same relationship. Now, yeah. Matt is kind of famous for having like a rite of passage, where after a practice, he asks you to stick around. And he pretty much has his way with you. It chokes you unconscious and beats the dog shit out of you. Did you go through that with him? Yes, I had a couple of times where he um, choked me <laughs> like, and beat the fucking living piss out of me. I mean, just the fucking <laughs> shit. Out of me. I think, I think, uh, you know, I don't know what, I think people don't, I mean, just beat the shit out of me. People don't understand what it takes to get to that point at whatever you're okay at. Okay. You know how many times I've been. You know how many times I've been beat up to get to like to you know it's like boxing or, or any sport jujitsu. It's like, do you know how many times that person had to get armbarred not to get armbarred or how many times I've broken my nose? I can see a crook right here. I can't breathe. How many times I've gone black guys? How many times guys have beaten my ass to event? You got to keep to eventually get to that level to where now you're equal. Now you're beating them up. It's it's a very it's a game of just very very less than inches. You know what I mean? You're just it's a grind, dude. It's a super grind. Wow. Yeah, no, it's uh, absolutely legendary. I think that the Pacific Northwest, in terms of, like, grittiness and, like, tough fighter, you've got all of Hume's camp, which is legendary. Charlie Pearson, legendary. You also got Team Quest out there. Yeah, we, we, had, a lot, we, had, a lot, we had a lot of guys coming down for that. I mean, it was just at that time back in the early 2000s. I mean – I wish I would have wrote some – I mean, you could look back at the names that were there because Pride at that year was the biggest. I mean, that was when they had everybody, you know what I mean? All the superstars had the biggest fights. So it was um, it was crazy, man. I'd never been in anything like that where I'm just living and breathing. Pride is paying for me to live in a hotel and then paying for my food and paying my salary to train. That's it because that was silent Pride then. You never fought for him, though. No, I didn't fight for him. I'll tell you why. I had six months, and I was, and I fought a couple of times under that. Super Bowl was kind of the feeder for Pride, and I went three and zero in Super Bowl. Okay, under Pride and under Matt Hume, and Super Bowl was out of Hawaii. And then after the third fight, they literally, and, and granted, I had, I had a lot of amateur fights, I had a lot of kickboxing fights, I traveled a lot already. They're at at the three and zero. They were like, hey, okay, under your contract, we're going to pay you $5,000 to now be in a fucking tournament where Gomi's at. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. You're telling me you want – they wanted me to be in the tournament or fight somebody like Gomi. So I would just – they're basically just pumping me up as an American, right? Right. To pump me up to beat the shit out of me. I'm like, listen, I'll go any day to to Gomi. So at that time, he was amazing. But I'm 3-0, and and that guy's – he would he would have destroyed me. Let's be honest. At three and zero at that time, I was not ready. So that's when I said, "You know what? I'm going to take a stop. I'm going to box professionally." And I went. I want to say I fought. I went to fourteen and two as a pro boxer. After that, um, hold on. But I, uh, Michael, I want to bounce back. Sorry, my timeline yeah. is so crazy. So back when I moved to ninety eight in Houston, I forgot to say this when I was at Houston Kickboxing Gym. This is how I uh, Matt Mike Altman brought me to uh, Saul Solis's gym. Dude, saw so least, bro. So this, is, so this is where I was introduced to MMA. I didn't train MMA. 
I was brought in specifically to fight these guys stand up because I had such a my my background. I mean, I probably had over fifty amateur fights to boxing. I was already traveling, representing um, a lot of things for kickboxing. Had a I think an amateur something amateur pro. I don't know whatever title at sixteen. And uh, Saul Solis brought me in with Mike Altman, and then they were. Uh, this was when um, Rico Eve Rodriguez. Edwards. Eve Rico, Eve Edwards. Rico, Rico Rodriguez yeah. was a world champ. So Rico's my buddy. He was world champ. Tito was just training there. He wasn't even uh, – he wasn't a champ yet. Eves Edwards was the undisputed uh, lightweight hey, Car- champ. Carlo then, Prater? Uh, Carlo Prater was there? Brought, oh, bro, they actually brought me in for Randy. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Kevin. Randleman. Kevin Randleman, really? the heavyweight? The heavyweight, I, he they just wanted me to spar him because we're I, you know he's only five eight, but I was one hundred sixty five pounds wet. We just did uh, kickboxing, and they brought me in because I was the best. So I would spar everybody there, but it was mainly to help Kevin out, Randleman for his. He was like two forty. They just he had a, he, was, he was a great wrestler, but they wanted me to just do stand up with him, no wrestling. So I was Freak brought athlete. In this guy, Freak I mean, this guy had yeah, he I got veins. He had veins popping out everywhere, dude. So we, we would spar stand up, and that's how I got to know the whole like kind of MMA. I, a lot of the top guys in I don't know ninety nine or whatever, or maybe two thousand, like that group of guys. You know, I was introduced whenever. Don't quote me on the year, but right around there. But kind of Sol- wild, huh? Yeah, yeah. So Saul Solis, obviously a legend. Um, he, he that guy, Rico Rodriguez, Tito Ortiz, Rampage Jackson. You want to talk about like championship level fighters where they went to get their boxing? It was Saul. Well, if you look at this, so my Goldman brought me in their good friend, Saul Solis. But at the time, even Rico Rodriguez was a heavyweight world champ. But Kevin was the guy there because he was 240, veins sticking out of his thighs, and he was the pride champ. So we were – everybody was getting ready for him at, at Saul's in Houston. So super cool. Again, just to be very clear, I did not wrestle. I did not roll. And I, did I just came in as a stand-up, um, stand-up and just sparred guys specifically for stand-up. Because they need help with that. How was your time with Randleman? Uh, well, he got mad a couple of times, but he couldn't. How could he beat up a? How could he like? He couldn't wrestle me and kick the shit because I was 17, 16, 17. He threw a forty-five plate across the room one time because I was beating him up. <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> sounds about right. Yeah, yeah he, house guys. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he 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 really liked me. We had a, he really liked me. Uh, you know, uh, we had a good time. I mean, he, he knew I had been doing sound forever. So it was very frustrating for him to try to catch me as I'm boxing, kickboxing, him, just, you know, pretty much picking him apart. Cause you know, he, was, he, he really didn't have that great stand up. I mean, he was an amazing wrestler, legendary, amazing MMA, yeah. but it's all two different, two different scenarios. Right. Correct. So a, a little shortly after that renegade extreme fighting, October 12, 2002, you went to a four-man tournament. Were you of age at that time? Ooh, I don't know. What year was it? 2002. 2002. October? Yes, I graduated high school in 2001. So I was, okay. I was <laughs> You got Raul uh, Guerra and Buddy Clinton. Buddy Clinton was a, uh, a very seasoned veteran at this time. Yeah, he... Um... And again, that was before I went to San Diego and did the whole wrestling thing. But um, knocked the guy out, Pancras, open hand style, the first guy. Before it was a tournament, four man tournament, right? Or yeah, not the first guy, open hand palm, and then the second guy heel hooked me. And man, I had never felt and I had never felt so much pain in my life. I'm surprised he didn't rip my knee apart. I didn't know what the hell he was doing to my foot. So why do you move from Hawaii to the mainland? Oh boy, let's see. Uh, my dad had a my dad had a change in jobs and partners. So, um, you know, my mom was born and raised in Hawaii. All my family lives on Oahu back there, and um, he just had he had he had an opportunity, and we had to go. So, it was um, it's pretty mind opening. You know, you go from from Hawaii where you know, it's beautiful to Houston, Texas, which I mean. Houston's Houston. I mean, I'm not, I don't live there anymore, but um, <laughs> it's uh, it's hot and humid, and yeah, it's definitely different. Very hot. 
Okay. So you're 16 years old. You're obviously bouncing all over the States. How do you find city kickboxing? So again, 16, then moved to, moved to um, San Diego in what? Oh, four, right. Oh, four, oh, three, somewhere around then. So I drive, I said, I'm going to go box in San Diego. Uh, I want to be close to the beach. I don't want to, I don't want to be in Hawaii. Right. I don't want to move all the way back to Hawaii, but I want to be somewhere next to the, to the um, ocean. And um, so I literally, my girlfriend at the time who is my wife now, uh, been together 22 years. I'm like, Hey, we had just started dating. I'm like, I'm moving to San Diego. I might go to college. I might be a bartender. I might fight. I don't know, but uh, got a couple grand. You want to go? She goes, sure. So we just packed the car. I started driving out there. Um, and we, we had no plans. I had, a, I had a family friend I could stay at for a few weeks before I found a job in a place. But um, no shit. This is, this is a true story. I'm driving out there. And my good friend from Houston, Texas was going to Davis at the time. And he was a wrestler in the Davis College Wrestling. Uh, California right? Davis Davis College is that the name of it Davis College UC, UC Davis yeah okay I'm sorry UC UC Davis and um, I'm like hey Reed Shelger a buddy of mine great wrestler I'm like hey I'm moving to San Diego um, I need a job I could bartend um, but uh, I prefer to kickbox and you know or box or do anything teaching is yeah hey. um, I'm gonna hook you up with my buddy his name's Uriah Faber he's the king of the champ cage and gladiator challenge champ uh, uh, champion like okay have you ever heard of him no oh uh, you guys got to get together be friends I'm like all right whatever dude just give me his number i need a job so uh 2000 yeah 2004 i think I, i'm on the road driving to california with no job hey you ryan <laughs> hey what's up dude You're the champ okay yeah yeah um just call this guy mark dion i'll vouch for you because your best friends of my my good friend at uh cal U's, or davis um and he'll give you a job I uh, got to go in and just uh, interview or, you know, show them your skills. Like, okay. So that's, I became good friends with Uriah back in 04 because I didn't even know him at the time, but he vouched for me. And I went to city boxing, sparred a couple guys and uh, knocked a couple guys out actually. And then I got a job. <laughs> so thanks. Thanks, Uriah. <laughs> nice. Weird. So I, I don't think people understand how sm the people think that, you know, because you see everybody on TV. But it's actually such a small community when the top guys, or back then it was for me. Everybody knows everybody. Still is. Everybody knows Still everybody. is. Everybody sparred everybody. They just see on TV and they say camps and that's It's so small. Back then it really was. You know, everybody kind of knew everybody. And, you know, um, so it, even, even now it's still not that much bigger, but there's a lot more guys into it. But um, so it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uncommon to, everybody crossed their path so much with so many people, especially when you're training other places and going, going to different places, you know, this was before the ultimate fighter TV show too. So it was before the explosion. It was very small. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even know what the hell gladiator challenge King of the cage was, but Uriah was the champ. I'm like, yeah, dude, I don't care. Just give me a job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's your regional promotion. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't care. dude. I need, I don't want to be, I don't want to bartend in San Diego. <laughs> so that november 2004 pride tryout um i had a couple buddies that went and everybody was just going no man this one and one guy you know lots of sparring and all that stuff but this one and one guy just cleaned house and i'm just sitting here like well so and so from militich was there you know mike rogers from st louis sent a couple guys there and i'm just like a one and one guy like won the tryout and everyone's like, dude, you have no idea. Yeah, it was, it was crazy, man. And actually uh, after that, you know, cause uh, Dan was, I think it was a champ back then. I can't remember boss. They had picked me, but I became really good friends with Dan back then. And uh, we were training. Dan Henderson. We were, yeah, we Dan Henderson. It was fun, dude. You know, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun, man. <laughs> so how come you wouldn't go move? To like Temecula with Dan to train with him. Um, you know, I didn't. I seriously, I was down in San Diego already. Um, I remember I had moved to San Diego because I wanted to kickbox. I wanted to really box. 
And, you know, I was going to get more into that. And I actually got into the MMA by accident with the trials. I, t- I, you know, I told you the night before I was out drinking, just while these guys are training every day for the trials. I'm like, oh, sure. I'll just join. Who cares? I'll just do it today. I'm here. You know, I think what helped you out is you didn't know who your opponents were. <laughs> Probably. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Super Bowl, April 9, 2005. You got Malik Williams. You knocked him out in the first. <laughs> They bring you back July 23rd, 2005. Bryson Kamaka, you knock him out with a head kick. And then they send you over to Icon. You got uh, Patrick Fritas is a promoter and Rich Chow is the matchmaker. Somebody that you would deal with again in the future where you fought Harris Sarmiento. And dude, Harris uh, Sarmiento, I forget his record. That's a tough motherfucker, bro. So much. He's uh, so tough. Like, like you look at his record. It's like, dude, you got to erase those numbers. That guy will fuck you up. Period. I saw him fight live twice and was shocked at how good he was never, as compared to his record. Forward. I never nope. saw him before. I think, um, you know, I think the game is so mental, right? And I, in my mind, I just, I know my past and didn't look into it so much as somebody else would you know so it's such a mental game but when i look back now i mean god that guy's a that guy's a tank dude a tank and he took he could take a punch you know i mean god he was he was great man great fighter a lot of great yeah he was 20 and 10 i mean you're you're two like three and one really two and oh if you think about it i mean you really didn't have any training in your first event no no but i i remember i had a long history in the Full contact and the boxing and the kickboxing, but I don't know. You like you look at both sides. You look at his side. He's so confident MMA, but I was so confident in my standup. I didn't even care. You know, like I guess uh, ignorance is bliss, right? Yeah, Sarmiento's tough as tough as shit. You stop him, and Gary Shaw from Elite X. He picks you up February 10, two thousand seven. You are his big signee. Like you're the one that like he's putting his horses behind. And they give you a crazy horse, Charles Bennett. Well, back up. So the reason that well, I was with Mark Dion, got, uh, you know, guy writes his soul. He had um, Brandon Vera at the time. And Brandon had got like the biggest, best contract. I was, um, what I had done after those three fights with pride was I went on to box. And then I boxed, I, I, I'm sorry, I went on to box. And you're right, signed with Gary Shaw. Because I had a two uh, two contract deal, but initially I wanted to go to the UFC, but Mark Dion was holding me back, and 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 Dana knew about me at the time because he wanted me to get a bigger contract, wanted me to fight in two. I I wanted to fight in two different sports, which was boxing, which was my first love, and then um, and then MMA, um, and then I don't I I believe he, Mark and Dana couldn't come to agreements back then, so. That's when I signed with um, Gary Shaw. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, he allowed me to do both sports, which was, uh, which, which is cool. You know, I'm not saying I never got to any, you know, um, accolades as far as like any titles in boxing, but it was just my first sport. And I, it, was, it, was, it was a first love sport that I loved, you know, so um, I really want to do that. And uh, he, he allowed me to do it and it, it was great. Well, with with uh, Charles Bennett, you were obviously the, the horse that he was backing. Um, was there any pressure going into that fight? Um, n- you know, no. I just didn't know how strong Charles was. Charles, I mean, I mean, he's so crazy. Literally, his yeah. name. But I don't think I think a lot. I think you, you know you see. I think just people see a lot of this. They just see what's on TV. Charles is a great guy. I get along with him great. He's a fucking amazing athlete. What is he? Is he five ten or five nine or five eight? And he's not that he's tall. Like, he can, he's like five seven, five eight. Yeah. He can dunk a basketball. He can probably run faster than any fucking NFL player. The guy can probably bench and squat. The guy's a super athlete. Yeah. I could. You could literally put a that and that guy's hand, he probably hit a home run. He's a super athlete, and I did. I took for granted 
how strong this guy was because my I had gotten my chin tested before, but not like that. So Charles is just, I mean, the whole buildup, yeah, he is crazy, but he's just, I mean, the guy's a super athlete. So I want to say I took him for granted and I got caught. It's a game of, you know, it's a game of inches and um, the guy is a tremendous athlete, super duper strong. You know, I'm really glad you, you, you say that because I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves. Like that guy, he's <laughs> never been in a fight where he wasn't the underdog. We got, we talk about journeyman and, and like, and I don't know if there's too many now because, you know, but, and, uh, you know, UFC, whatever they build the guys now and you have the undefeated record. It's kind of more like boxing, but more back then. And I don't know, you guys correct me now. I, I don't watch too much. But, you know, a lot back then, a ton of guys had losing records, even myself, and it just didn't matter because you're going against the best, and who cares if they lost? You knew it was going to be a war. So I don't know what Charles' record is, but he's fought every single buddy. So like I said, you just – back then, you there wasn't a lot of guys to pick off or build records on. You're just like, throwing it with the best. Here's what you got. Go ahead. <clears throat> I, I he's, agree. I, he's he's thirty and forty five now, but his record <laughs> wasn't that checkered back then. I didn't he look can't. at it. But look who he's fought. I mean, before, oh yeah, everybody, every single person in the world, literally. And the guy is a whole, the guy is, yeah. So um, I respect him. I respect him. Yeah, big time. He he knocked hey, out I, Vanderlei Silva. I mean, come on, you got to respect everybody that comes in there. I mean, you have to respect everybody that steps in the ring. I appreciate it more now. I would. I don't. I don't want to step in the ring anymore. <laughs> I, yeah. you know, I, I, and we'll probably get to it. But I remember, and we'll get to it later. I remember the day that I remember the strike I got hit with the kick. I'll tell you later. And I'm like, I'm good. I'm done. Because it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, here, Crazy Horse, eighteen, fourteen, and one. Uh, he was a big underdog. I, I think it was just one of those. Awkward angles. It's crazy, horse. You just you don't know what you're gonna get. He <laughs> he gets the upset. July 27, two thousand seven. King of the Cage throws, throws you in against Edson Berto, dude. Edson hold Edson on, Mike. Berto. Hold on, Mike. Have you ever have you ever seen um? Did you ever actually see? So I never knew until a couple of years later. But my buddy goes, yeah, you actually clipped each other at the same time. Did you? See yes. He, he he yes, absolutely. He got the better of me, but uh. And he took a knee. We, it's weird. It was almost like a, I'm not going to say a double knockout, but a double hit at the same time where he got rocked and then he just, he, he, he saw me, jumped on me earlier. I'm not <laughs> sure how he didn't get knocked out on that because you you landed flush. Well, the guy's a fucking, the guy's a, like, he's an animal. Yeah. The guy's a I, great athlete. So I, I think. Mm -hmm. Edson Berto's 12 3 and 1, heavy favorite. Um, you know, people keep talking about that crazy horse, crazy horse, crazy horse. Um, Edson Berto is an absolute savage. And prior to the fight, it seemed like you weren't even concentrating on him. Prior to the fight, you had, you had said, I know there are people with better records than me and more well-known, but I have the most exciting style for Nick Diaz. It was possibly the most polite call-out involving a Diaz brother that I have ever seen. And you got Edson Berto in front of you. Yeah. Um, again, a lot of fights. Um, and I think the pancreas fight you had mentioned, open hand, which I lost to a heel hook, was so painful. Edson Berto was known for his heel hooks, and I I trained that every single day, all day, because I didn't want – I knew I could beat him stand up. I did not want to get heel hooked by that guy, Edson Berto. He was just a – he got a lot of guys in heel hooks. Um you look at his record. So <clears throat> I feel like if I could take away his strength or just not be in pain, my knee popping out, then uh, I thought I had a pretty good chance. Yeah. Yeah. So 31, you knock him out. Kit Cope gives you a call out. Um, it's always nice to know like the other California guys are paying attention when they start calling you out. I was always hoping um, to see Kit Cope fight. But your next bout was November 10, 2007, Elite XC, 160-pound title fight, Nick Diaz. You got your wish. That was um, it was uh, it was it was it was a fight, man. It was uh, I got the opportunity, and when opportunity calls, Knox, you had to answer the door. So it was definitely um, 
it was great, man. It was, I thought it was, was, it was a great fight. A lot of training. Um, I, and I go back to when I, just to give someone the credit, Carlos Baruch, um, Ferreira, black belt, um, Brazilian, can look him up. He, who was, he was my teacher after I came back from pride at city boxing, He's still there at the citybox.com, Carlos Baruch Ferreira. Um, and they maybe can help me, but he's been a black belt and he was from the same school. I want, don't quite, I want to say as Anderson Silva and them back, uh, you know, his friends at Nin, all those guys from Brazil. Uh, I don't know if they came from the same school, Ninja, Shogun Brothers. Um, guys, is the shoot box, the shoot box guys. So you're all shoot box guys, but there was, he said growing up, there was only a couple. I, I want to say it was, is it Carlo or Carlos Crazy? Uh, don't quote me. I have to look it up. You about Carlinos? No, Carlo or Carlos, the son of what they're all under. I have to look it up, but uh Okay. Well, Carlos black- Gracie is one of the heads of the IBJJF. Like that guy is if you look at Carlos Gracie's lineage, it is one of the most impressive things that you can you can find online in terms of jujitsu. You know what? I don't don't call me wrong, but if you look on City Box, I I wanna sorry I'm so bad with the memory. Um I wanna confirm. He was my jujitsu coach, and he uh, give me a second because I want I want I want I want I want to I want to confirm this um, who he's under. That's uh, and he was he's he's amazing. Um, God damn, give me a second, guys. I yeah, take your time. Really... Joey, what was your old badge number on the fire department? Twelve twenty seven. Okay, here we go. Sorry, guys. Carlo Carlson Gracie. God, Carlson Gracie. Oh, dude, yeah. come on, dude. Carlson Gracie. Okay, yeah. I mean, dude, one of my heroes, Carlson okay, Gracie. Okay, so 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 what? So he so he so after Pride, he took me under his wing, and Carlos Brook for uh, right. He's under. Um, I'll just read. I'll just read some of Car- Carlson Gracie. He has a black belt. Carlson Gracie. So he grew up rolling every day with Rodrigo brothers, Vitor, Antonio, um, Sperry. These are the guys that I can just keep going on. We're under the, they all grew up together. So these guys were always coming into the, you know, into the, um, into the gym. They were the champs at the time. It was, you know, crazy. He has, he, he's amazing. He taught me. So I really, when you look at like pedigree and you get into something, I had the best, I, I, you know, at my hands. And that, that's kind of why it really helped me out in the career. So you get Nick Diaz going into this fight. Bro, I, the Diaz brothers were just at the beginning of what they've become today at this point. And you beating Nick Diaz, it was almost as if children that you say no to at the store for candy on the way out, like that reaction where they're screaming and crying, you beating Nick Diaz, it was almost as if like, like Trump winning the election, like what took place with the other side. You know, it was the most – so the most exciting for, thing for me was – and, again, imagine people only – because you, you jump on the scene and it's kind of like when you look at anything else, any type of sport or whatever entertainment, you're like, who the hell is this guy? You're like, why are they – so then you look at their kind of – a lot of guys are history. Like, oh, they've been putting their whole life into something. They didn't just get lucky one shot. And that's how it always kind of kinds of looked looks for a lot of people in any type of sport or any type of, uh, I don't know, whatever they're doing, but you know, I've been grinding since five years old and that was my goal to become a world champ at the time. It wasn't to be an MMA world champ is to be a boxing or kickboxing champ, but then that evolved into what MMA was. Right. And the excitement for me really at that time was how much, um, how much respect somebody like um, Nick Diaz had at the time, because a lot of people, I think it's when people say today, like a lot of people don't even they're they're newer fans. They they only know Nate, you know. Right. And Nick was and and I'm I'm not saying anything away from Nate. Nate's amazing. Nick was better Nate's than Nate. Nate's brother, I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know if you would ever say everybody knew that, and I don't know about today because Nate's great, but Nick was bigger. He was better at the time. More well rounded, for sure. And more well rounded. That was so weird at the time that people don't understand, is that Pride was the biggest at the time. And then UFC was getting the picture. Elixir was kind of the middle ground. 
But at that time, everybody was talking about, and Nick went back and beat Gomi, who was technically who was officially the number one ranked person in the world. He schooled Gomi, so that made Nick. That's kind of what made the title legit. It wasn't 155; it was 160 because Nick couldn't make weight, obviously, at 155 to every room. But it was kind of it was that's why I mean because Gary wanted to back him, right? That's that's a fact. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. Yeah, I mean it's that's actually one of my questions. Yeah, so it's, it's why like, is it at 160 pounds? It's got to be yeah. for Nick, not you. Yeah. He's having such a hard time, you know. Let's hit this guy's and I want to chant. We'll get him a good fight. And the fact that Nick beat Gomi, I mean, Gomi was just a beast, dude. Oh, in a war, yeah. You know, you just it's kind of what's kind of sad is about fighters is that as you start to as you watch them, they, they, they deteriorate. It's kind of like anything else. Um, you just kind of always remember what the last thing was instead of remembering how badass they were back in the day or whatever it is. Like, you know, like, oh, yeah, that guy got beat up his last fight. He was terrible. But you forget these guys are just – when they're in their prime, they're just so amazing, you know? Um, Gomi, man, he was amazing back then. He was doing everything. and He threw the kitchen sink at Nick, and Nick beat him to death with his chin for a minute, and then Nick took him to school. And what put him in a Uma Plata or some shit? Something crazy? Go go Plata. Yeah. Go go Plata. Like, yeah. I'm like, dude. Uh so that was and that was really exciting to get a chance of that. I know it was a once in a chance once in a lifetime chance opportunity. And um you Well know, here, I- let's talk let's talk about mentality. Let's talk about your mentality. You're three and oh, and you're like, I'm not ready for Gomi. Now it's at 160 pounds. They're offering you the guy that beat Gomi. Like, where are you at at this point mentally? Well, think about that, right? But between the three and O and Gomi, and then I had had 16 pro fights. Another, I think three, two or three MMA fights. So I had, you know, I was, I was. That's in the time where I had up to the Nick fight. I was in prime shape, 24. Of all those fights I had, you know, I had what I just told you I had six or 14 or 15 pro boxing fights back to back to back to back to back. Then I had, you know, those those fights in MMA. So I was ready. You know, I was in taking no time off. And I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do it. What do I got to lose? All right. So I had heard a rumor that afterward, after the fight, that Nick challenged you in the parking lot of the hotel the next day. That was actually um, in Hawaii. Okay. That was, that's another story. And, 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 and there's, it's so, it's kind of funny to talk about now because, you know, like, I mean, Hey, I'm a huge fan. Even when Nick fought this past one or, you know, anytime Nate fights, I mean, cause trust me when you're, when you got Nick, you got to get Nate too. So it's always like they come in combos, but Back then, uh, my dad was live at the time too, so he had my back, and he's a pretty big guy. So we, yeah, that's a, that. Uh, yeah, actually, no. So what happened was he had a fight in Hawaii, and after that first fight, and we had a, I think I had fought. So let me see if I had fought. I can't remember, but uh, yeah, we were we were actually on the. Um, I think I I think he fought, and I was invited on Hawaii, and then we we're the same in the same hotel. Oh, we, oh that's when we got in that uh, thing in the ring. We started throwing the bottles, and they brought that me. was Eve Edwards. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Eve Edwards. That, so that was, okay. it was wait, wait. Let, let me just kind of like preface this. There's, I know we're bouncing all over the place. Okay, okay. There, there's a dozen different times where Diaz and this gentleman and his family, the Diaz family and the News family, almost clashed. One or two of which were on TV. Several other times were not on TV. This is one of them, like a parking lot altercation. <laughs> Yeah, so after the, the so the one that was in Hawaii after the Eve, Eve's Edwards fight, you know, um, we're in Hawaii and like it's like after the fight in the parking lot in the hotel. Come to find out, we're in the same hotel on the same floor in Hawaii, and like my cousins are like they want to. I got found there. They're like, hey man, we want to go take care of this. Literally, we almost got in like half a dozen other fights. They're calling the cops. So like the next day, or maybe it was that night. I mean, we re- I mean, literally, it was like the next day. Everybody's trying to vacation. Like we almost got like, you know, cops were kept coming to the hotel, and we had to get moved out of the hotel room. I'm gonna say it was the next day. We had to get so many altercations trying to fight each other. And I think we're at a bar. We ran it. They cut a walk in like the day after. It's night 
two or night one, right? And they're walking in, and sure and shit, there they are. They see me. Another, my dad walked over and said, Hey guys, we're just here to like vacation. Like, so are we. Let's just stop. I'm like, let's just enjoy our time in Hawaii. Like, yeah, we're going to fight down the road. Who cares? Like, thanks. <laughs> let's just call it quits for a minute because it was so much kind of funny. So my dad kind of, <laughs> They said, hey, we're, we're done. You guys are done? Like, yeah, let's just enjoy our time in Hawaii. <laughs> like, yeah, let's chill. <laughs> this so, is getting it, old. So the Nick Diaz fight um, stopped in the second round because of cuts. The Did you expect it to play out the way it did? I mean, you had Nick Diaz boot scudding, boot, a butt scooting at you <clears throat> at one point. You know, I think – and we can talk about layers. Like I think um, styles make fights, right? And in my style, at the time, what he's doing is like the perfect style for how that came out. Now, Nick, and of course, the judges saw it a different way on our second fight, but he beat me by decision on the second fight. Five round war. Of course, I felt like I won it. He felt like he won it. You know, um, I don't know what the stats say, but as far as what's landing and what is, but whatever the judges call it, that's what it is. So to say styles make fights, styles do make fights, but he adjusted the second fight is which why he won by decision. And I have to respect that. Now I might thought there might be a different income, but that doesn't matter because it's still what it is. Right. And, and you got to give props to that, even though styles make fights. So, so your question, the style made the style of the fighters made that first fight. It was a great fight the next fight, but again, he adjusted, which, uh, you know, made him able to win the next title. Or right. whatever. So, so just so everybody understands, Nick butt scoots in that fight and KJ continuously lands an overhand right. Like it's always finding a home and Nick continues to move forward. Afterward, Nick gets plastic surgery and has the bones shaved down in his face because like of the cuts he sustained in the KJ Noons fight. It's this tough sport, man. I don't think people realize they just, you know, it's kind of like uh, football. I can relate to that because I watch, you know, we all watch it. It's like, so what is it, a uh, Monday quarterback or Monday quarterback? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you had your cousin on the MTV uh, America's Best Dance Crew, Distorted X out of Houston. Giving you a plug on your title fight, your next bout, July 14, 2008, Elite XC. You've got Eve Edwards. Did you, was Gary Shaw mad that you beat Nick Diaz? Or how, how was he to deal with at this point? I mean, I guess he was kind of forced to play his cards, right? So now he has two people he can promote. So he promote Nick and now he promote me. So, um, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's actually, it's just a business, right? To him. So he has to work it with what he's got. Um, and he's been, he's been in it for a long time. Gary was, so he knew what he was doing as far as, um, doing what he could to pick up the pieces and, and, and promote more fights. Right. Well, Eve Edwards, 34, 13 in one. Um, did you guys work out together in Houston at all? Yeah. So I don't know if you remember. So I said back in, uh, and I, I don't quote me on the year, but again, I moved to Houston 98, but between 98 and oh one, somewhere around there, whenever Kevin was the champ, Rico was the champ, Tito was Rico the was the champ. champ. Yeah, I think Kevin was training for uh Fedor Emilianko for a world title fight. He wasn't technically the champ of fighting in okay. a title fight. So go, yeah, I apologize. It was right around that time when that was, so we were uh, we were sparring partners back then, me and Eve, um back in those years. And um, yeah, we go on great. Um, because he's an amazing athlete and he was actually kind of on his second way up on, um, of his career, um, which kind of worked out and we just, he was the next one, uh, you know, that, uh, the promotion wanted me to fight against. Did he request that fight or did he politic to get it? I mean, out of everybody, you get him. I, I don't, I don't, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't know who he fought prior. Um, I don't know if you can look. But I know he had won a couple of good matches, and he was kind of back on the come up, which uh, made for a good promotion fight, you know? Yeah, I think yeah. he won on the undercard of your Diaz fight, so that kind of put him back in the mix. Yeah, and he won against somebody. I don't know who it was. I don't know. Um, do, 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 you, do you see who it is by chance? Yeah, I get it right now. He uh, Nick Gonzalez. 
Yeah, I don't know. He, no, no, Nick Gonzalez, wait, t- t- tough guy, journeyman. Nick Gonzalez is a tough dude, but title worthy. You know, it's yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. kind of one of those situations. Um, I'm going to tell you what, what took place in 48 seconds with punches, elbows. Um, it shocked everybody that you went through Eve Edwards the way you did. That was shocking. You know, it was just kind of that time where I was never, you know, you never stop training. So you're always, you know, you're just kind of come off the last win. You never kind of get out of the gym. I think um, now what hurts people is they don't get enough time in the ring. So, you know, you, the thing that hurt most is the injuries. And whenever you win a fight and you have to take so much time off. So it's like, okay, I'm going to go travel, go party. And then, you know, it's going to take you a couple months to get back in shape. So that time it's just kind of more back to back, which was, which was nice, you know, as far as uh, I was just ready for the next fight, but um, yeah, man, it was nice, man, to go back to Hawaii and uh, defend a title back there. Cause of course it's like, you know, and, 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 and he had, he had, he had, he had fought a lot of great guys too. And oh, big time, dude! He's a legend. Legend. Okay, okay. So, so he's actually coming off of a flying knee knockout of Ensign Berto. That's his okay. fight right before KJ. So that's what got him the title shot. Okay. So you look at you know the guys, the guys' history, and that's kind of what. Um, yeah, first ballot Hall of Fame. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer for sure. I mean, the, the, the guy is so good. So it's crazy because then you're like, you know, you know, like imagine even trying to do something, and and again. When I was 18, or uh, when I met my my girlfriend when I was 20, 21, and uh, she's my wife now, I said, hey, I want to just go maybe to college, get a job. She's like, no, just keep doing the fighting thing until it runs out. So, I mean, she's the one that really pushed me to keep going. And, you know, when you look at this, what I'm coming around to is something like, you know, you're, you're 24 and you win a title. It took your whole life to get to that point. But then after you win it, right, and you find like, man, I made it. Everybody's like, hey, you know, it's not a real title to you defend it once. I'm like, what? Huh? Somebody's always like, I'm like, what does that fucking mean? It's it doesn't mean anything to you defend it once. I'm like, what is this? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Eve Edwards. Um, after that, I mean, it's it's the Neil Blaisdell Arena. Your father had fought there. Obviously, your father and yourself. Um, could not be closer in terms of uh, individuals, and the Diaz brothers enter enter the ring. Uh, that was a promotion thing, you know, by uh, Gary, of course. Actually, he he had fought somebody earlier that night. I forget who it was. Uh, Nick did. They brought him in, and yeah, just things started flying. And that's kind of it's, it's funny. It, it, I mean, it, it's funny when you watch it now. It looks like WWE. F and stuff, but it it was real. I mean, we it was so real and, and so funny as you get older, and you have kids. It's like you know, like, and the kids they're they're only nine and eleven, so they don't really understand too much. But it's like, yeah, we well, you know, it's like how you go from hating somebody so much at the time to now we're sitting on the couch, I'm showing the kids, and and they're their fans. You know, it's mm-hmm. like so so weird how you go from like ah, oh, it's not it, it's not that bad now, but it was so bad back then. It looks yeah. like it. Was, rigged actually it looked so fake but it was so real he had bill goldberg doing oh. post-fight interview nate diaz nate diaz giving your father the finger and nate at this point was very far behind nick they've kind of exchanged positions but, but they had so, had so many fights at the time it was i think he already done the ultimate i think was he on the first ultimate fighter i can't remember but i mean he had so many fights too but um yeah it was just i mean it's at the time, it was so real, but you almost can't even write it up like that. It looks so <laughs> right. It looks like right out of a scripted like brawl. <laughs> so, so just so everybody at home understands, the "Don't be scared, homie" catchphrase was born that day. I eat, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I I even bought it. I dude, I bought one of the t-shirts. I I, so I made me buy a t-shirt, dude. <laughs> it's, so, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good, right? <laughs> Uh, um, Nate Diaz threw a water bottle at your father. Your father went after Nate Diaz. And <laughs> like I said, one of the few documented brawls between the two families, although many took place. It's 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 so funny. It's almost you can't even you can't even make it up. You know, you can't make this shit up. You know, 
In 2008, your manager, Mark Dion, mentioned working on a fight with uh, Eddie Alvarez. Um, it never came to fruition. Would you say Mark was helping your career or hurting your career at this point? You know, God rest uh, Mark's soul, but um, definitely he – I just wanted to fight. and He, he, had, he had different um, – I guess he had different motives and a different way of doing things. Um, Probably could have been some better decisions, but um, you know, kind of at the end of the day, you just got to kind of live with them, and, and that's it. It could have been done better, right? I think it could have done a lot, been done a lot better, but uh, you know, it just it is what it is. At the time, you you kind of put your trust in people, and 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 in his mind, he's not doing the wrong thing. But as you look at in the past, how it pans out, it it, it might have been, or probably was, but. It just is what it is, right? So, yeah, just so everybody, yeah, so everybody understands, uh, you defend it uh, July 14th against Eve Edwards in August. He's talking, your manager's talking about Eddie Alvarez in 2008. Right after that, your name's in the conversation to fight De La Hoya for his final fight as well. Um, in September of 2008, you get stripped of the Elite XC title for not rematching Diaz. In October, Seth Putricelli, Kimbo Slice fight happens with Ken Shamrock pulling out, and Elite XC is over. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do we? Oh, that's right, because I fought Nick in Strike Force. Um, I think what Mark was really looking for, and why, while Brandon was there, was in UFC, and he was holding me as kind of a carrot to. Like, I want this, Dana, if you want KJ, a negotiable, uh, trying to negotiate. is He was more about the money, and that's kind of where that portrayed, because boxing, right, we were only making enough money to – in MMA, we were only making so much, which we're making, you know, good money, but not boxing money, where you look at these crossover stars that, you know or, – or, I'm sorry, you look at these boxers that are making money that can retire you. Retire you in one fight, right? So um, that was kind of the play on uh mark dion and it never portrayed out and it definitely kind of um yeah it, it didn't go it didn't go very well hey mike i have these russian hey, piss real quick yeah, 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 yeah go ahead let me uh hit pause yeah. there we go okay so um mark dion obviously you guys had some of your issues after you get stripped of the belt October, Seth Putricelli, Kimbo Slice takes place. So where Ken Shamrock is accused of blading in the locker room. Last-minute replacement, Seth Putricelli knocks out Kimbo Slice. When did you know Elite XC was over? You know, there was already some rumblings on um, – a lot of rumblings on financing and this and that. So it just – I mean – the fight game is it's a it's a tough it's tough you know it's just like anything else it's as uh, far as a promoter it's like any other business if anybody's trying to start that business it's to be successful it's 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 tough you know so um there was already a lot of a lot of rumblings but if it's it's hard to and it, it's hard to put your back on something like that anyways right you want to put your back on real champs and that was kind of more the entertainment side which is fine it draws numbers right but still you want to build a real league or class you got to be behind the talent which you know which shows why UFC is doing a great job as well you know okay in 2009 you officially part ways with your manager Mark Dion who did you go with after that oh that's a so now well now we're gonna so I went with myself I don't know I don't know I guess you're gonna tell me I guess you're gonna tell me what kind of decision I made after that uh, so we'll see what <laughs> my you know, you know, it was, it was, there were just so many bad decisions made. Um, and at that time, you know, what was left, it was just strike force. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Elite C was now strike force, which is all the same people except for Gary Shaw and Rick Coker was back in the seat and Dana. Scott Coker. And, Scott Coker. Yeah. Yeah. Scott Coker. And just Dana, which at the time was just working with Joe. So, I mean, I, mean, I had the, I, I have Scott Coker. I, it's called Joe Silva or. Scott Coger or, you know, the guys are telling me to call Dana, and that was pretty much it. There's nothing to really negotiate because 
it, it is what it is back then. There's not really too much you can negotiate. Well, you were supposed to fight Melvin Gillard September 16th, 2009, and you were replaced by Nate Diaz to fight Melvin. Were you in communication with the UFC at this point? 2009? I'm trying to think who was I fighting at the time. Was it for UFC or Strike Force? It, well, here, they, they, it, it was rumored you were supposed to fight Mel- Melvin Gillard on UFC Fight Night. I mean, probably, probably was in transition with... Um... I'm guessing I was probably in transition with uh with Elite XC. I'm pretty sure I had a pretty sweet contract with Elite XC, better than UFC. I'm guessing, don't quote me. And Strike Force absorbed all their contracts, I believe. So I could either negotiate or keep my same contract. But I'm sure there was talks in that. I wanted to at the time, probably I probably wasn't worried too much about money. That's probably why I got away with from Marcus was for Hey, let me just fight the best guys and be the best league. So I, I couldn't um I think probably been in the background there's probably some promises to or negotiations to make something else happen. Maybe that's when I I mean I didn't go to that. May I stay with them because maybe I don't know what year I fought. I fought Nick twice. Maybe there's an offer of that. I'm, I can't remember. You can maybe help me out, Mike. On the- yeah, yeah. So so here, the canceled bout that was September 16, two thousand nine against Melvin Gallard. In 2009, you signed with Strike Force. Um, you do an interview stating that you've known the guy since you were 16 years of age. Um, Strike Force Miami, Rich Chow was the matchmaker. Billy Evangelista was supposed to be your opponent. That gets canceled. So there, there's a big, lar- a large amount of time, MMA wise, that yeah. you haven't fought. Obviously, you filled it in with boxing and kickboxing. Um, but you you fly out dream to Japan for Dream 13, Andre Amade, March 22nd, 2010. Wow, I totally forgot I even fought in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, guys, crazy! Yeah, that's crazy. I totally forgot about that. Um, wow, what a time, huh? <laughs> you know, you, you were you were having some issues, uh, May 28th, 2009. Enrique Enrique Gallegos, you won a decision, um, but you had a, a fast start flooring Gallegos, and then you started gassing. It seemed like your gas tank was you were having some issues was that after uh, after Pride. I'm sorry, after a Dream. Yes, it was. Well, you was it May 20, 2010? I might I might have the year off on that. Yeah. Uh, oof, I don't even know. Was that? What, I'm I'm sorry, Was that Strike Force? No, it was boxing. I can't even remember, dude. I'm sorry. No, okay. Hey, dude. I can't dude. Even remember. No. Um, I'm not punch drunk yet, but I, I, I'd have to see a video. You had a lot of fights. You also I'm had a lot of fights. I, I'm sorry. I don't have – a lot of them aren't even – yeah, I'm sorry. Here, here, here we go. June 17, 2010. Um, Connor Hewn is your opponent. Okay, uh, yeah. Strike Force. There's your, there's your opening Strike Force contract. Yeah, Hugh is no joke. No, no joke. I'm under under um under what's his name? Um uh Tenth Planet, um Eddie, right? Yep. Yep, Eddie, Eddie Bravo. Uh, he's black belt. Uh actually uh that fight, um, I still have it today. I got about my my rib sticks out on my bottom floating rib, maybe about an inch or maybe yeah, at least an inch out my thing. He broke my caught my rib out when he got me in a uh he's behind my back. Um he had his legs around me. Yeah, he, he the first round, I helped my rib, my ribs crack it. He, I think, I think he broke my rib. I got a rib sticking out still to this day, <laughs> from from Connor. He almost choked me out. He had my back. Um, that was good, dude. Um, I just, I probably underestimated a lot of people. And then when you get in, you're like, God damn, this guy's really good. The guy was good. Um, luckily, I came, luckily I came on top on that one. Um, but what, just, you. Yeah, you had a, a a a big target on your back as well. Like you were very high profile. I don't think you were getting the high profile money. Yeah, but you were high profile. Everybody that that was coming up against you. Your post fight party was at Lucky Strike Bowling Alley. Your father got in a fight with uh, reporter Eric Fontanez that night. <laughs> That's probably the norm back then. He was getting in a fight every night, man. He was. Uh... He was an old, uh, big old Irish dude. Always wanted to fight. Never made it in the ring, but could sure did make it in the bars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
how, how important was your relationship with your father? Um, it was good. He was, uh, you know, it was, uh, we had a, a, a good relationship as far as when I was older as friends, um, you know, tough growing up, pretty tough, I guess, uh, old school, right? You only, you only know what you know. So, um, just tough growing up. I had a great life in Hawaii. He had a lot of great things. He worked really hard, but very disciplined. Um, just, you know, I guess old school is all I can say, you know? Yeah. Okay. You do something wrong, get the belt pulled out. Do something wrong, you get beat up, you know what I mean? Beat up bad. So I know it's looked down upon now, but it's, it's how it was back then, I guess. How I was taught. Yep. So. Yeah. He made you do the work, do the work. Yeah. Don't take the easy way. Do the work. He's one of those guys. That's it. If you don't, you're getting it. <laughs> oh, um, George Gurgel actually, George Gurgel, you're at the event, the Strike Force event. You beat George Gurgel. You knock him out in the second round. It's the same f- event where Shake Shields beats Dan Henderson. Mm-hmm. Mayhem Miller shows up in the post fight. And the Diaz brothers, the whole scrap pack is born because they attack Mayhem Miller. Oh, man. What so, was that? Where's that guy now, Jason? Probably in prison. I probably. Know, crazy <laughs> yeah it was uh yeah uh what was the question i'm sorry mike um, you were there i mean you were there for that like <laughs> it just yeah you don't see that stuff now it was kind of like yeah it's like it's crazy right it's just people just flying in the rain they had to really start uh finding people you know like hey, you can't just fly in the rain you know start fighting and they were really trying to control it it's just it's just funny when you look back at it now because it wouldn't it wouldn't happen today <laughs> well, here you're in the same building. Nick Diaz won't let that fight go. Was there any pre-fight issues prior to George Gurgel with the Diaz brothers? You know, um, George Gurgel. George, and that was in Houston, right? George Gurgel. Yeah. You know, I was uh pretty sick. I actually um I got staff. I got MRSA. Oof. Um, yeah. Uh, like two weeks before I had moved, I went to Houston and I got MRSA and um, I don't know, like I actually had MRSA one more time after like later down the road. But when I had MRSA back, whatever year that was, I want to say 20, 2010. I don't know, 2010 um, yeah. They're like, okay, yeah, MRSA. It was two weeks out from the fight in Houston. I'm staying there. They go, okay, we're going to go to the ER right now. So I'm in the ER and they're like, okay, well, here's a, I mean, I had a morphine button and I'm like, I'm not in pain. They're like, okay. And, and, and nobody could visit me. And people that were coming to my secluded room were coming in full body ty- typhoon suits, like the, the movie, the outbreak, like bubble. people. Yeah. I'm like, Hey, well, what's going on? Like, am I okay? Like, no, yeah, you're okay. You're okay. They kept saying you're okay, but I wasn't okay. Like they kept coming in these spacesuits and not want to touch me, and I had the MRSA and um, yeah, they chewed antibiotics for about uh seven eight days in the ER, and then eventually I got out and I'm like, you know, they weren't really, they were never testing for anything back then, so um, I I was, I mean, I'm sure morphine gets out of your system in a day or two, anyways, but um, and I went and I fought George Urgell and I was I was okay, I was okay, but um. That was kind of crazy, that whole MRSA thing for about a week in the ER, uh, about a couple of days, and got out a couple of days before the fight. But yeah, uh, and, I, yeah, antibiotics destroy your cardio. Uh yeah, I guess. Um, it didn't for me that day. <laughs> <laughs> any any issues with the Diaz brothers, being that you guys are in the same building again? Uh I can't remember. I don't think so, Mike. I don't think okay. So. Okay, that's fair. October 9, 2010, you go up to 170 pounds for the rematch to fight Nick Diaz. Mm-hmm. Is that, did they force this match on you or is it something that you desired? You know, when you're just negotiating for yourself, you're just, you, you just want to get the fights out. You just, I just wanted to fight. So it really didn't matter. And, um, and they want to, they want to rematch, which I want to rematch as well. And I don't think the, they didn't do 160. Straight Force didn't. And he wasn't going to make 155. So we said, let's just do it for the title at 170, which wasn't a problem. Because I don't know who he had beat, but um, it just made more sense. And, you know, 
I I mean I'm not I'm in no fight shape right now, but even back then, I mean even if I fought one fifty five, I mean the the lightest I would ever be is under maybe maybe one eighty. You know, even fighting at one fifty five, I was always one like in shape, top shape I'm one seventy five. Like I'm usually around one eighty or more. So like I'm like, yeah, I'm like don't cut more weight, sure. <laughs> you know okay yeah I, I don't have to cut 30 pounds i'm okay with that you know yeah you lose a decision to nick diaz um do you feel that the rivalry's finally like done at this point or were there's still some issues between the two camps afterward it was done i felt like i had won the fight and i said or like he felt like he won the fight um and he adjusted well and um they gave him the title it would have been great to fall in that line of winning a couple division world title but it wasn't the time or the place and the judges saw it differently and and it was a great fight you know um i think it got fight of the year like we banged out dude we banged out like hundreds of punches five rounds you know i think the staff read the stats were hundreds of punches of mma gloves for five rounds straight did you see the fight it's fucking nuts. I try to watch them all. It's fucking nuts, dude. Yeah. Just an like all-out war, which is great. He adjusted, and um, yeah, it's it's fun, man. You know, he got in there, banged it out, um, and he came he came out on top, and uh, mad props to him, you know? You fight some of the sport's biggest names here. I mean, Nick Diaz being one of them. Your next bout, George Masvidal. Did you know at this point that, like, Diaz obviously – had a, a good foundation for his name, but Masvidal, he went stratospheric after this. Did you predict that? I felt like with um with Nick on the second fight, I felt like I won it. So it wasn't, you know, I was more hurt. Uh, I, w- I was more like, oh, you know, like more about my pride, but um, George beat the brakes off me. And I, I've never been beat down like that. And I told him like, man, I think I mean, like, I think, like, the way that we adjusted it, I was like, man, you should be world champ. I told him back then, I, what year was that, 2010? It was, uh, yeah, he 2011. Really, he already had so many fights before me, so many actual fights, and then so many street fights, and he already had so many fights after that. I mean, the guy, I, I he, I, I knew he was going to be, I, I don't think he won a world title, but he should have, goddamn, but um, that just shows somebody like, I think mean, Usman beat him, how good that guy is. Yeah, he was 20, 21 and six. I, I worked with him over at Bodog, and I just remember yeah. George Masvidal. George, George, dude, he is he was so underrated. I didn't even take him that serious. And when I say, I mean, I've been beat up before, but he beat the brakes off me. I was like, holy shit. The only thing he had to tell me is like the only thing he told me was, man, you're the toughest dude I ever fought. So basically, I beat him up with my face. Uh, I beat his, I beat his I beat his fist up with my face. He beat the shit out of me. And uh, and uh, he was like, hey, the best company he had for me was, man, you can take a punch. I was like, thanks, I guess. Yeah. That guy, <laughs> he's like, you're the toughest guy I've ever fought. I'm like, um, so yeah. So my face can take a punch. Okay, thank you. In uh, At Bodog, he was always professional, always on <laughs> time, always on weight. But like when you were talking with him, like – you always felt like I'm on the administrative side. I'm thinking this guy wants to fuck me up. Like this guy, like I, I always was just like super polite out of fear, not because like I was worried about not being a professional and the people I'm working for his eyes. Yeah, no, that guy, no, that guy's I, fucking I, legit. I actually studied his fights more after I lost him and the guys got great strategy, great style of fighting. And I'm not surprised how far he went. I'm actually, um, I, I thought he could have gone even further. The guy's really good, but he, like I said, I beat him up with my face. His hands must be sore. You didn't have a, a single easy opponent after this either. Like Billy Evangelista was 11 and one. You beat him by decision. They threw you against. I, I haven't even looked at my, I haven't looked at my stuff in so many years because I've been so focused on this other side of my life. It's kind of funny. You're saying these names like, oh man, I didn't, re- I, you know, I didn't realize. He's eleven and one, dude. He's a fucking stud. <coughs> yeah, stud. You know, like like your career, like if you look at your the casual fan will look at just numbers on a record. 
the person that actually knows what they're talking about will look at the names. Dude, you got Josh Thompson next. <laughs> yeah, me and Josh. I don't know where Josh is at, but uh, I don't know if he's commenting now. But um, he, again, just – I just wanted to fight, and he wanted to win. <laughs> and Josh knows that. He's a great – he's such a great athlete, and he just played it right. And he's a – dude, he's – I don't know. Is he? A, he's, he's a great fighter. It is yeah. I mean, I forgot I even fought him too. He's a great fighter, man. Um, wow. These guys. Yeah, he was cool. nineteen and four. He was nineteen and four. So like you're, and there's not a lot of fat on these guys' records. Uh, Strike Force brings in Ryan Couture for you. Uh, this is right when the UFC. I believe this is when the UFC bought Strike Force. Um, this was a match. I was kind of surprised you lose a split decision. I was a little shocked at that. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I think um, I don't know if he's got what ties he has there, but uh, those those type of losses don't really, I, even at the time, right now they really don't. You really don't give a shit. But back then, when you're in it, it it hurt at the moment. But everybody knew I won, so it wasn't too big of a deal um, for me. Um, yeah. So yeah, just not, not another good one. Donald Cerrone is nineteen and five. That's your welcome to the UFC fight. <laughs> yeah, I dropped my. Uh, I'll definitely say I I busted my. I dropped my load pretty early on that. As far as like, I just had no gas. Again, Donald, great fucking athlete. Another one, uh, right behind Masvidal, beat the brakes off me. Literally, beat, and he I took. He said he was a stand. Didn't stand once. Took me down. Did a perfect game plan. Um, another guy I beat up. With my face. You know what, though? Neither of those guys could finish you, though. I mean, they're, they've they got a high finish rate. You're not yeah. on it. That's because this chin can take a lot of punches. Great. Again, another great athlete. Um, just, Hall of Famer. Uh, we here. Well, I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared for it. Uh, it was just so – imagine the whole build-up for it, and then it was a big adrenaline dump. I'm not making excuses, but he had a great game plan. It was, it was, yeah, I took a beat down. Well, if you look at your record, Nick Diaz, he's not in the Hall of Fame now. He will be. Uh, Masvidal, I, he's not in the Hall of Fame now. He will be. Uh, Josh Thompson falls into that category. Him and Eve Edwards, both of that fight will probably go into the UFC Hall of Fame. So, like, you, you've got huge names. Cerrone just got, in their last year, George Sortropolis, you beat him by decision and you fight a guy that's probably going to be in the UFC Hall of Fame, him and Spencer Fisher, uh, Sam Stout. Dude, you knocked out Sam Stout, bro. Yeah, you know, I think, I think, I think a lot of, I don't know, is it, is it the MMA Hall? It's US, UFC Hall of Fame? It's the UFC Hall of Fame. Yeah. I, think, I think my downfall, yeah, I wasn't in the UFC early enough. And unfortunately, because I wanted the boxing route for some of the decisions. But uh, yeah, a lot of these guys, great fighters, and um, I would, I would have to say without you talking to them, like they would agree. You get in there and we bang, and, and that's it. You know, um, that was that was another tough guy I forgot about. I have I haven't looked so long back to this Mike because been so busy with work and the kids. But yeah, Sam Stout, you know, I came out in thirty seconds. He's twenty nine and one at this point. He's got I think four or five fight of the night bonuses. Uh, Darren Cruikshank, no contest. I poke and Alex Oliveira. Um, your original opponent was supposed to be Jan Cabril and they pull in Alex last minute. He's uh, Alex got 21 Alex. F- fights in the, yeah, Alex so I, I Oliveira. To Darren, when I was, uh, I don't know if it was a no contest or I lost, I can't remember. No so contest, was- yeah. Uh, he kicked me. He's not, I did the George, I did the five tag because I was pretty much done. But I'll, I, I'll tell you right now, I had my first son already, and I uh, was kind of not looking too much to fight anymore. And I was, I just feel like I was there, but I wasn't putting my heart into it. But I remember he kicked me in the leg, and man, it hurt. I never, nothing ever hurt. Like I, I'll tell you right now, I was willing to die in the ring at one time, and this, and this hurt my leg so it hurt my leg. Oh man, this is stupid. I'm not fighting anymore. <laughs> I don't want to get punched in the face. So after that Darren fight, I really wasn't kind of into it. And of course, I got offered a lot of the pretty good paydays, but I was willing to just stick it out. 
you know, keep getting there, the education, work regular jobs. I didn't, I said, I didn't call back and say, I'm good. So they kept fighting to just kind of move on to the next step. Cause I already had, I was coming up my neck, my, on my next boy, as far as my son. And I just wanted some kind of stability as far as in my life, you know? Well, you look at it this way. You were also during the, the Masvidal fight, you were also planning your wedding. You know, you just, life has to go on. Right. But it's like, I, I'd say, but when, when I, uh, you know, most people say, I can't understand how you got, you see a punch in the face. Like at the time when you're in it, you don't, right. You don't think about it or you don't want to, or like, you're just looking for the goal. You're just trying to keep striving, keep going. Who cares about the uh, opposition? You're just trying to reach a, a to B, right. Get there, win, do whatever it takes. But after you start having uh, the responsibilities, other things in life, kids, you're like, oh man, it's, this isn't the best. This isn't the biggest thing in my life. Right. Um, so that's kind of where things kind of, you know, they, they pull you towards other things in life, other responsibilities start pulling you away from that. And they're like, man, I got to reevaluate. And, and then maybe that's when the kick or the punch starts to hurt. <laughs> I, I tell you like here, Dean Lister, Rob Kamen, Mike Fowler, like you, I mean, Brandon Vera, Dude, you oh. trained with some of the biggest names in the business. It was fun, man. Everybody that was legend back in the day, and it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Full dedication. That's why when people come out to you even today, and hey, man, see you play like you're now like, oh, thanks, thanks a lot. Before he's like, oh, you know, wouldn't really appreciate, it, but uh, you know, because it took a lot of time and a lot of discipline, and it took a lot of my life. It took a lot of my life for my 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 wife and even my kids the time so it's it's a real dedication i really give up to those guys that are you know to this day still putting everything they can into because it's tough super tough so i'm told you uh do jujitsu lessons at the fire department now <laughs> i don't do i don't do i don't do too much jiu-jitsu we uh I, I might show my i got my two sons nine eleven. i might show them a little bit here and there but uh apparently they can fight they said even though i haven't taught them anything <laughs> Don't worry, you, Daddy. I know how to fight. I'm like, no, you don't. Are don't you going to get them in the game? Are you going to put them in the game? They don't want to be in the game. They, 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 they base their baseball and other sports. They, uh, they're, they're. It's just, it's different. They're, they're, they're great. But uh, no wrestling. Not in their repertoire. No, we, we wrestle. And we do stuff all the day. They want to just train to defend themselves. They, they're, they're not. Uh, Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't want to shut a door on them, but I'd prefer they don't. Let's pick up a pick up a baseball and uh, do that, or uh, make some uh, money know. there. Make some money picking up a baseball. Yeah, <laughs> save some brain cells. How about that? Well, here, your father was a legend in kickboxing. Brought you along, showed you everything he knew. Made sure you got training everywhere else. And now you're looking at your kids and your. You're not too into like passing that on, huh? I'm willing to pass on so they can defend themselves. But other than that, if you don't want to, if they don't want to fight, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> wow, wow, KJ. I know you. You said this is your first and last interview that you're going to do. You're done with this, man. I, I, your career is something that I, I think, um, it's underappreciated. And uh, greatly sure appreciate it. We, we greatly, greatly appreciate you coming out. Well, whoever I didn't mention in the past, I really appreciate it. And it was a lot of hard work. And whoever comes up to me, man, I'll tell you what, it was, uh, it was a great ride. And the ride ended. But um, a lot of time, a lot of dedication. And, and that's what I take in my current life and, and put it forward to my family, my kids, my job. And it, it definitely transitions. And it's maybe a humble person. So, um, Really appreciate the time. Excellent. Thank you so much. And our buddy Tim Ford, man, he really can't do this guy's coming through for us. I don't know. You, Dean Lister, and Brandon Vera all must owe him huge favors, or he's got blackmail on you. It's one of the two. <laughs> he's a great guy. He's got a bunch of he's got a bunch of others in his pocket. He's a great dude. <laughs> well, anyway, KJ, greatly appreciated, brother. We'll be in touch. All right. Another one in the books. KJ Noons. That was a good interview. Thanks to our man for hooking it up. So, Timmy Ford, you got Dean Lister, and then you got KJ Nudes. Dude, those are two good gets, bro. We're working on uh, Brandon Vera. <laughs> That's a good one. He, yeah. um, he, he might be battling Eddie Bravo for 
for president of the Flat Earth Society <laughs> right now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got, he's, a, uh, he's... I've got a bone to pick with Vera because he is half Filipino and half Italian, and he yeah. never talks about the Italian side. So yeah. <laughs> that was that was always frustrating for me. I think you know, he, you know, he it like in certain in our circles, he would always he was always bringing it up. I'm half Italian, you know what I mean. But I think you know, look where it got him. He's living in the Philippines, uh, being a movie, being a Filipino movie star. So <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. And the the tallest Filipino guy walking around there, I'm sure. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> does he speak Tagalog? He does. Yeah, he absolutely does. No yeah. way. Fluently, fluently. Yeah, yeah. You know, like if you look at his one FC career, there's lots of time and space in between his bouts. I wasn't sure if it was like contract issues or, you know, uh, well, I mean, away at the movie set. I, I wasn't sure what was going on, but I know he was very popular in that organization. Yeah, yeah, he was doing good. Um, you know, every fighter has its uh, expiration date, right? Yeah, but I, he. Yeah. Um, he found the fountain of youth somehow, somewhere. And no doubt. Uh, he had a resurgence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Let's talk about KJ Noon. So, you know, these cats yeah. for a long time, you wrangled them in, dude. Like we always ask, listen, we need a producer. We need someone to help us with thumbnails. We need some, like, we need a shitload of help here. So, when guys like you step up, dude, man, bro, it's always a home run. Greatly appreciate Trying it. to do what I can. I mean, I get a lot of enjoyment out of the podcast, man, before I even talk to you guys. I was like, this is what needs to happen. It needs to be documented, all these stories and stuff like that. You know, like, it's very important. And I'm just trying to do my part. You know, that's well, it. I, And you were part of it. Like, you were part of it, too. Like, being a part of that scene back then, it was, but like, in the Dean Lister interview, we discussed, there was a big difference between, like, the Midwest, East Coast, and, and West Coast. Like this Sean Strickland type is what we dealt with in our locker room, but you guys were a little bit more refined than the Midwest. Yeah. And it's like yeah. the bouncing around of different, uh, different areas is, uh, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty it's interesting. intriguing, man. Yeah. Like, like Fickett used to come train at city boxing back in the day too, you know, like that's first. And I looked him up. I was like, Whoa, okay. And he's pretty mid uh, Midwest guy. Right. Yeah. Uh, he's an Arizona guy, but like okay. us, in the, us in the Midwest, we accept him, you know, like, he's, right. <laughs> you know, out of ring behavior and, and things of that nature <laughs> certainly lends him to the Midwest. Um, gotcha. So K, you got KJ Noons, Dean Lister. Uh, I'm re we are recording. Uh, what's his name? Um, Luigi Fiorverante, proud Italian. Okay. So, That's a so hard okay. one to say. Yeah. So Luigi He's he's been interviewed a bunch of times, but he's never been interviewed properly. He went to the Marines. First, they rejected him because he was obese. Somehow lost the weight, goes to the Marines, winds up training with Rafael Torre and Gerald Strebent for like a year or two. Okay. That'll so we're kind of coming, you know, full circle on that uh on the Rafael Torre story. We're kind of, we're getting all the little nitty-gritty guys in. So we're hoping to record with him tomorrow, and that'll be our, our, our following release. But Joey, you, you're just intent to hit the Tory story from every angle possible. <laughs> I don't know why. I just do it. I like it. You know, it's, it's interesting. More of a, we got it's more of a, you. You got a dark side. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Joey, we got the review. So, ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, anything you guys write in that review, it's going to be read here but it's got to have five stars. It has five stars. No matter what you write, we're going to read it. All right. Blazing. And we're going to prove it right now. We're about to prove it right now. Blazing <laughs> M3 said, someday when we're all dead and gone, MMA historians will go through these interviews and green heaps of important details on the life and times of these great warriors. Greatly appreciated. That's not the one we're talking uh, about. Here it is. See, Mike Davis, Chris Lytle, and the and the, the rest of the crew are doing huge service, documenting exactly what was going on, not only in these fighters' lives, but in the sport at the time. As someone who's been a hardcore fan since 2003, many urban legends are answered in these podcasts. Details about things I've always wondered about. Thank you for all you do for the history of the beloved sports. And I think I got one more here. Mm -hmm. uh, with, 
Wisconsin HT. Fantastic. Stumbled across this podcast a few months ago. If you're not a Chris, if you're not a Chris Lytle fan, you're not a real MMA. If you're not a Chris Lytle, you're not a fan of real MMA stars. I think he's trying to say if you're not a fan of Chris Lytle, you're not a fan of real MMA stars. Joey, please, please don't correct our fans. There's we don't have a lot of them. Okay, that's what he meant to say. We don't have a lot. Yeah, I've been <laughs> jumping around. What the hell? You corrected me on the pronunciation of Charlie Kohler yesterday. God. Yeah, you called him Charlie uh, Kohler. <laughs> whatever it is, I was close enough. You knew who I meant. All right, I've been jumping around episodes, kind of missing. I did, I did. Kind of missing Miguel Iterate. All right, there we go. Okay, so and here's the if you say it, we'll read it. We'll read it. Here's the thing with Miguel: one lifelong friend. Like when you talk about like trees in the forest that you're kind of growing up in that guy was one of the thickest oak trees that could have possibly been in my life what transpired was well if you look at our first 100 interviews we don't have actual videos it's all thumbnail he's the reason for that now how it got there is something that is really i don't want to discuss because it'll it, it, I would just say it terminated our relationship and, and it like, not just like friendship period with everything surrounding that. I'm just, I'm just being honest here. I haven't addressed it. I've tried to push through. You put in a five-star comment. It is what it is. Um, love the guy, miss the guy. Can't have him in my life. That's it. And then here, Chris, I, and Miguel, all three of us, including Miguel all said that, we've got to go in different directions like in life everything so when all three people including him and chris and myself it is what it is so there we go okay all right fair enough wait, wait no detail you're still in chris lytle's life right well yeah it's my guy dude the fuck? Okay, okay. You said all three of us decided to oh, go. No, 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 no. It, it, it could be confusing. Right here. All right. All right. And I'll push it even forward. Chris's schedule with BKFC is so friggin' intense. Like when he calls me up, he starts with, Yeah, dude, I'm sorry. So it's like he hasn't been here in a while. But, you know, I mean, that's essentially when Chris and I got together, it was, hey, dude, we need to document history. We're both historians. Um, our relationship, my relationship with Chris was always kind of like, um, through a mutual friend of ours, but it was always hardcore history driven. So when he's like, Hey dude, I kind of want to get a podcast going. And history was like the obvious route because it's something that I excel at as well as he enjoys. So. I was kind of wondering it. about that. Cause I know a couple times he had to go cause there was a fire or an accident or dude. something. He had to leave in the middle of the, of the dude, Yeah. <laughs> dude, <laughs> but, well, he left the police department. And he's working with BKFC full time right now. And like okay. between prospect series, uh, regular events, like they have put so many duties on him. Like I work for BKFC a lot as well. And like right. I get I, I get preferred status in two different airlines because I'm flying so much. He's probably got double the airline miles that I have. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah like I'm pretty bad. His is just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So Tim, who Brandon Vera. Who else we picking from your your little group of guys, Matt? I don't know. Anybody Maybe I could else? ask Ch Charlie Colaire. Uh, <laughs> That'd be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> we could do. Um, I don't know, man. I could talk to Jeremy Stevens. Maybe we got Jeremy. We got Jeremy. Oh, oh yeah, you already got Jeremy. That's right. Okay, yeah. So, right. You, um, you, so were you part of the Alliance crew then? Is no, well? We, well, I was part of Victory, but back back then, it's like everybody that that broke into the different gyms trained basically at a city boxing and you know or fabio santos back in the day and we all just partied together and, and went to fights together but it was weird because you know when when uh brandon vera left city boxing and became city boxing versus alliance and we're we were fighting each other in in uh in tj at baby rock for the total combats flipping each other off from one side to the other and you know what i mean one 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 time one of their fighters would win one time one of ours would win so it, it turned into a rivalry that you know, it's, they were like Cobra Kai to us for a while, but um, no, nah, it, it, it's all love. Uh, we're all we all come from the same place, you know. Yeah, of course, yeah, of course. And what yeah. about Mark Dion? Mark Dion is somebody that's been coming up in our interviews recently. Yeah, Mark Dion uh, unfortunately passed away from uh, ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's, and uh, he was the owner of City Boxing. 
uh, from the Northeast and, uh, he was, he hit the town running. He opened up city boxing was, you know, Brandon Barra's manager, you know, KJ Noon's manager, obviously. And uh, a lot of uh, bo- upcoming boxers on the circuit. Yeah, D- yeah, uh, D-listers, D-listers as well. As well. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So, but he butted head with a lot of people. He had a strong personality, but, uh, you know, he was a good dude. Yeah. That East coast delivery is, uh, <laughs> something that like when you experience it you've been told yeah. what it is but then when you experience it you're like oh okay uh-huh. i know exactly yeah, my, what that is yeah all my family's from urban jersey city right next to new york and uh, you know when i first met them i'm like what the hell is wrong with these people <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> so, yeah 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 the east coast, the east coast delivery is interesting in fact dude we uh-huh. probably only had like four people from the east coast on and it's not like Oh, wow, you know, I just don't want the East Coast fighters. It's every East Coast fighter that like I send a message to, it's like I get a fuck you from. <laughs> I mean, it's just you know, I mean, and that means hello yeah. in their language. That means I, hello I, in their language. I, 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 it, there's always like a, like a chip on the shoulder, and yeah. I'm like, okay, well, you know, if you want to come around, cool. If not, hey, dude, you know what I mean? Like, we yeah. don't really have too many issues finding guests here, but um, yeah, I, I, the East Coast, but you know, they're all also like some of my highest viewed is from the east coast so it's it's like a double-edged sword it's like i get a ton of views on them more more so than anywhere else but they're harder to come by on the other hand and i'm a little biased but i think your 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 west coast legends interviews like i mean you know um those those were the best man you know what i mean like all those all those orange county stories you know the eric apple story you know like all that it's good stuff man hey well you know (laughs) we, we, we try but you know also it's like well i get like messages from east coast guys like the california guys a guy named fred hammer he always kind of keeps me in the loop and he's just like no man the information it's almost as if you're regional and that's that's like the goal you know it's even though i'm a midwest guy we try to keep the interviews regional so it's like super micro to where the people there can't like point because you know sometimes like you hear somebody talk and they say something they go ah bullshit Got you. <laughs> and it's like, uh, we're trying to like not let that happen. You know, it's like where people, where people believe it's just like, no, I mean, it's the information is good coming from, uh, coming from the areas. So, yeah. but all right, Joey, like, share, subscribe. <laughs> oh, there goes the kid, which you probably can hear, hear a lot more of that. Um, like, share, subscribe. Five star reviews and make us say whatever you want. Whatever it is you want. You guys want more questions about what took place with Miguel? Give me a five star review and ask it there. That's it. Yeah. Tim, you plugging anything, dude? I know you you like to play out, right? Uh, yeah, man. Um, yeah, play all over San Diego. Uh, if you if you come, just drink tequila or bring earplugs, and you'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tim, at BKFC, brother. I hope you make it up, man. I'd love to hang out with uh, obviously you and Joey when I'm out there. Appreciate you guys, that's man. Right. Cool. That's right. The Lights Out podcast crew, we're doing a meet and greet at the uh, Bare Knuckle event, so come and say hi to us. 100%. Absolutely. Thanks, gentlemen. Take care, guys. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.